Hello everyone,、uh, it's Terry from Umezushi here, and today we are going to talk about knives and some of the other tools that I have in the tool bags, thanks to Alex's ideas, and I hope you enjoy this video. So, the plan is we'll go through everything in my tool bag. We'll look at a selection of knives that I have and other tools that's very useful in a sushi kitchen, Japanese kitchen in general. Then. We will look at how to choose a knife, sharpening, maintenance. So to begin with, I'll start with the deba. Pretty much the entry level Japanese knife. It's great for chopping. It's got really thick spine. The starting knife for anyone in a Japanese kitchen. And it's a bit harder to use, to be fair, compared to the Western style knife because of the single bevel. And the thickness. However, it's a very good all-round knife for cutting, chopping. Not great for slicing. We will use another knife for that. The next one is、um, probably the second most used knife in my bag. It's a Kirituke Yanagiba. The reason that it's called the Kirituke is that instead of the willow leaf shape, the front of this blade is kind of cut off. End up with a really sharp and a straight edge. This is really good for、um, slicing and scoring. This knife is custom made, so it's got a bit more weight than the usual Yanagiba. It also has a slightly thicker blade than usual. Just that's what I'm used to. I find that a bit easier to slice fish. I don't need to force the blade down, and I can rely on the weight of the knife. And this is also a Hongyaki. A white steel, and that just means the whole blade is made out of the same material. A lot of the Japanese knives is made out of a sandwich technique, so you will have a softer、uh, metals sandwich a hard blade in the center. And this is a standard Yanagiba. You can see the spine here and the thickness of the blade is a little bit thinner than the previous one. Also, this is the very, very first Yanagiba I acquire. It used to be about、uh, three centimeters longer. Over the years, it's been sharpened and played with and damaged, unfortunately. But this is the knife I learned to、uh, make sushi with, so it's got a lot of sentimental value. Next one, it's、um, kind of a good-to-have knife in my bag. I rarely use this, only when we have like a flat fish. This specialized. For、uh, fugu or just doing very very thin slices, and you can see the blade. This compared to the other two, they are much. It's much thinner blade, and again, this is also a blue steel.、Uh, remember, this was the one of the souvenir I went to Japan when I was doing my research trip. I got that in the. I got it from the shop in the、um, fish market in Tokyo. So those are like the basic, basic knives. You just need those two, two types of knife, a deba and a yanagiba, that would get you through most of the prep work in a sushi kitchen. But there are a few other things which is nice to have. Next one is a usuba. That is for vegetable. You can see that it has a very, very flat, very flat edge on the side. It's just great for chopping vegetables or. Turning、uh, daikons, cutting into thin slices. Next one is a wapeti. It's just a small utility knife. Really rarely use this. Only when I'm doing like more delicate、uh, dessert or fruit or、um, doing small amount of prep, I'll use this knife. It doesn't have too much use. I just thought it would be a good idea, but、uh, rarely use this. That is a gyuto or a Western style chef knife. Instead of like a single bevel, it has a double bevel, so the edge sort of reduced down to the edge evenly from either side. And this is made out of、um, a material called Damascus. You can see the pattern there. It's a sandwich of two materials and continuously folded during the forging process. Also, the knife smith or the swordsmith making this. Knife is quite famous in Japan. He's called Sajisan, and it's quite old now. He doesn't produce many knives, but 
this is one of these. Next one you have is a uh, shellfish knife or just an oyster knife. This one is the one I found most easy to use. It's got a pretty sharp edge and it really goes through the shell uh, fast and swift. And it actually, the sharper the, the blade, actually reduce the chance of blade sliding from the shell and cutting myself. So yeah, I like this one. So that's kind of all the blade and knife stuff finished. We'll go on to another useful tools in a sushi kitchen and it's called the uh, moribashi. That it's just a um, metal chopsticks, usually made out of some fancy materials like uh, you've got some ox horns and some hardwood at the end. A lot of this is sort of more artistic work than, uh, than useful, but it looks nice. That, just a pin bone tweezer, nice and easy. Always need to have one. When we fillet the fish, uh, we normally leave the pin bone inside and then take it out slowly afterwards. This is a uh, unagi spike. So you've probably seen it on videos and it's just to pin the fish down along the chopping board and we can then do the filleting uh, leveraging the, the, the spike here on the chopping board. Next time we'll do a video on unagi prep so you'll see how that's used. This is actually a grout brush. However, I find it very, very useful when uh, cleaning out the blood lines in the fish when I'm doing the filleting. So it, I will have one, always have one in my bag. That is a scaler made out of copper. It's actually quite sharp, even though it's got a, like a square tooth and this just helps to take the scale of the fish. Very useful, and that we got from Japan. But really, you can ha have a lot of alternatives. I've seen some new ones come out as just silicon rubber type of thing, and that seems like a good idea. It doesn't damage the fish, it doesn't damage the skin, so I might give that a try at some point. Or we could do a review of different scalers. Next tools we use a lot is um, Grater. This is a special wasabi grater made out of copper and each of these teeth on there is um, hammered by the knife smith one by one. They are really fast but it's a lot of work to produce this. And just some bamboo brush after you grate the wasabi you can just use that to brush it off. That's something a bit more unusual but this is a um, ikijime wire. So when you have a fish that comes in live and fresh put it in the ice water with a bit of clove oil and the sake to dissolve it, to calm the fish down, relax them, and perform the ikijime using this. Of course, we actually have another ikijime tools that we use in the kitchen, that is the water jet. And when we have time, I'll introduce how that helps to keep our fish clean and fresh. Last one, that is just a maki mat. So that just helps you to make maki. That's everything in the tool bag. The next section we look at the sharpening and the maintenance. We'll have a separate videos on the sharpening of the knives, so I won't talk too much about it. Really, if you have a stainless steel knife, there's very little you need to do to maintain the knife apart from sharpening. The important things are just keeping your knife dry and clean. You don't want anything, any food left over on the knife and make sure the knife is dried after use straight away. The, even though it's stainless steel, they do still rust if there's a, a substantial amount of moisture or water in contact with the blade for a long time. Or for example, you might have cut up some acidic food, then those acid will corrode the knife. Also. A lot of the knives has a wooden handle, so moisture is really bad for wood. It expands, it contracts, and it rots, or it might get moldy. So moisture is one big enemy to knife. Then the next bit of maintaining your knife is how you cut it. There are different um, purpose to different knives. They are designed for different things. And usually you can tell by the angle or the thickness of the blade, usually, the thicker the blade, the more um, force you can put into it. For example, Deba we talked about before, it's got like half a centimeter on the material. So this one, you can use it to cut through 
bones, you can use it to chop. But for example, if you have a like a guitar like this, the, the blade is only about uh, 1.2, 1.5 milliliters at the, at the back. This really is designed for slicing and chopping uh, soft to medium hard materials. You don't want to use that to cut through bones, fish bones or anything harder than that. Vegetables, it's okay. Uh, again, you might want to think twice if you want to use this on the coconut or like a durian, this kind of hard fruit. Once you've used the appropriate knife for the appropriate purpose, you can then look at how you normally use your knife. I try to chop or cut as silently as possible. That just means my knife has minimal impact to the chopping board. So reduce the noise usually means you are cutting more gently and also becoming more refined. It also helps you to maintain the edge of the, the, the blade. So if you are fortunate enough to have some carbon steel or yeah, carbon steel knives, then you need to spend a bit more care on your knives. After each use, you don't just need to wash it, you need to dry it. After drying it, you want to put some oil over it. The best ones, clearly um, mineral oil. It has no impurities and they would keep your knife really protected. If it's a knife that you use daily and you cannot be bothered to get mineral oil, a little bit of clean, just tiny amount of clean vegetable oil would do because you are using it every day. But you definitely don't want to use uh, vegetable oil on a knife that you are going to put away and store for a long time. And we'll just have a quick look at the sharpening stones that I use. You can see it's very, very thin. It's very different to the more traditional sharpening stones you would have seen like either natural or other composite because they are harder and the wear tear on this is much slower than the more traditional stones. I can sharpen my knife a lot quicker compared to other materials. Numbers on here, it just means the number of particles in a fixed area. I think it's inside a square inch. Then you have 1,000, 3,000, 8,000, 16,000. The advantage of polishing them to high grade is that you get a really smooth edge and a really smooth uh, like a side of the knife. When you slice, when you cut, they just glide through the ingredients a lot easier, a lot better. And this is a uh, rust eraser. Basically it just takes the rust away from the knife. It works magical. And normally the order we do things will be stuff on the rust eraser and then work my way up on the wet. Firstly, I will actually just learn how to sharpen the knife, then worry about picking a good knife. In terms of choosing the knives, the things you want to think about, to me, they are the materials. So there are many different kinds of materials you can choose from, like a stainless steel or carbon steel. Stainless steel, there are also different hardness inside and different composite. Carbon steel, again, you have a wide range of materials to choose from. Usually, these different materials is balanced between um, rust resistance, hardness, and uh, durability. So if you have a really hard knife, but has no durability or no flexibility in the material, then whenever you cut hard things, it's just going to chip. And if you have a uh, really durable knife, but not hard enough, then the edge wouldn't retain for a long time. Difference between carbon steels and stainless steel usually is the hardness. The added carbon makes the knife much harder, but it also makes the knife rust a lot easier. I would recommend starting from a stainless knife. The best material that I know to, which makes stainless steel knife is a material called VG10. And if you look up VG10 knives, you can't go too wrong. So that's firstly the material. Now the shape of the knife 
matters a lot. And the shapes, it's down to your cutting habit. Do you mostly slice or do you mostly chop? Do you rock your knife or do you just slice every time when you and lift up your knife from the chopping board? All this will affect how you want to choose your knife. To me, I would say normally start with a chef knife that can't go too wrong. Western style chef knife like this one here with reasonable curve really helps you when you are trying to rock your knife. Choosing a knife with good curvature would help you. Sometimes when it gets too much angle on the curves, it's really diffi difficult to rock your knife. And if it doesn't have enough angle, then you feel like it doesn't cut as well. You will find a lot of like uncut bits right at the bottom. After all that, you've fixed your material, you've decided on the shape, rough shape of the knife, it's best to actually hold it. Different knives has different thickness on the handle. And if it's a knife you're going to use regularly, this handle really matters. So depending on the size of your hand, um, the size of the handle would really make it uh, a very different experience. So I have reasonably big hand, so I find a thick handle really good and feels much better to use. It also feels more secure. But if you have a small hand, a big handle, you might find it difficult to control the knife a bit harder. So these are the few things I would consider when I choose a knife.